Okay, good morning. As usual, I will explain our plans for the week, especially since I wasn't able to post the new lessons plan, lesson plans, which I'll do today. And then I'm going to continue with the introduction of themes and the analysis of passages from chapters 13 and 14, which were left out from last Monday's class. And hopefully I'll be able to continue also with at least chapter 15 and 16, maybe 17 as well. So <clears throat> just to, uh, and, and I also want to hear your comments about the scenes from the TV series that we watched on Friday. But just a couple of announcements. I still have to review your notes from previous Fridays, which I'll do whenever I find the time. Last week I was very busy with reviewing 90 plus applications for a search whose committee I'm chairing, but most of that work is done. I also have a few emails in my inbox, which is not usually the case at the end of the week or at the end of a day. So in case you wrote to me, don't worry, I'll get to it between today and tomorrow. So as far as the week goes, on Wednesday, I'm going to introduce a new Machiavellian text, which is the new Machiavelli by H.G. Wells. On Friday, we will continue with House of Cards transitioning from the BBC series to the American version, okay? I will post a few readings, including readings, excerpts from the new Machiavellian text of Friday, and we will spend this Wednesday and next Wednesday on that particular text. I'm pondering whether to add one more text to our Wednesday series of Machiavellian text or to spend more time during the last week simply reviewing what we have done, discussing topics in preparation for the final exam. Soon I will also be posting times for the oral presentation, time slots that you can reserve for your oral presentation if you want to do it on Zoom, or there will be a few time slots also uh, for anyone who wants to do it in presence in, in my office. The other option for the oral presentation based on the paper would be for you to record a video, put it on the cloud and share the link with me by the deadline, okay? So first thing first, if you were here on Friday, we watched some scenes from the fourth episode of the 1990 BBC version of House of Cards and examined the Machiavellian nature of the main character, Francis Burkwart, who goes from being one of the leaders of the Conservative Party in, in the British Parliament to, by the end of the first season, being appointed Prime Minister. Do you have any comments about the series, about the characters, any questions? We can entertain a discussion for a few minutes now. Yes, Christine. I think what you said about um, about uh, uh, excuse me, Urquhart being primarily and almost Shakespearean more than Machiavellian, um, particularly with the addresses to camera, which he does several times, because right. um, Ian Richardson is, you know, Shakespearean to his core, but it's, very theatrical altogether. Yeah, very theatrical. It's, it's all BBC actors are just like mm -hmm. that, but it's um, it really was, you know, just a lot of it was, you know, noting the various, you know, just like moments where he's more Iago, and then moments where he's more Macbeth, mm -hmm. but they just very, very yeah. deliberately drawing that comparison where, because. Um, with Shakespeare, it's in some ways it's sort of the inverse of Machiavellian is that in that his, uh, his protagonists tend to have the kind of wrong virtues for the situations that they're in. They're better at situations than the ones that they actually run into. Mm -hmm. 
or they may have virtues that uh, could have been put to good use, but what is tragic about their journey is that the circumstances never allowed them uh, a fair chance to be good or valiant or heroic, right? Yes. That. And keep in mind, as far as the breaking of the fourth wall and talking directly into the camera, that that was added by the BBC series, repeated in the American version with Kevin Spacey. It was not part of the novels on which the series was, was based, Michael Dobbs, um, trilogy of, of novels with the same character. However, those novels, because <coughs> of the success, first of the BBC series, then of the American version, were republished and revised and edited multiple times to make them uh, match more closely the series to the point where they added um, at the beginning of each chapter, a, a, a short, uh, a, a few lines to mirror the situation in which the character is talking directly about the uh, readers, the viewers in their case, explaining what they are doing or why they are doing certain things or talking about life in general. Yes, but uh, I, I agree with the, the Shakespearean analysis of this. Who else? More comments or, or questions about the series we watched? Or even reactions, right? Uh, you don't have to like it, and I believe especially the 1990 BBC version is harder to like, especially because it is dated in terms of style. No one would produce a series like that, although the BBC might, because they have this penchant for things that are more theatrical, long exchanges, a lot of dialogues, uh, and, and little action really uh, taking place, right? So even your reactions are welcome to the style of the series. What did you think about it? I, I would appreciate a different point of view. And, um. Well, like, yes, definitely compared to, like, the, the American version to the new American mm -hmm. It was definitely, like, not even close to being as watchable. Right. But, um... And there is more than 20 years between. The yeah, two of right. course. But, um... It, it definitely had a lot of, like, big theatrical moments, and I like what they did with, like, the camera a lot. Really, um, brought you in. Um, I thought, for instance, it was kind of a psychopath. <laughs> I think that's kind of what they wanted you to think. Yeah, in, in a way, sure. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, it, it wasn't. It, it, it wasn't bad though. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just, I'm trying to read my notes here. And I write very sloppy, so I'm just trying to figure it out. What else do you have there that you would like to to share? Um, let's see here. I said the fourth wall things a lot. Mm -hmm. um, another thing is like when they're reading the newspaper. I forgot what happened. But the newspaper is like always facing the camera in this in this specific sequence, and mm -hmm. I thought it was very. Like, they, it was definitely like they were very intently doing that for some reason. I didn't really know why. But it was definitely something I noticed. Um, it's just oh, like that's a throwback, like that. right, to what Hollywood, especially, used to do a lot of during the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, whereby in order to move the story forward in order to summarize what has been going on during parts of the narrative that have not been transformed into scenes, newspapers are placed on the screen with enough time for the viewers to read. Of course, at that time, it was kind of natural because a lot of the viewers, the theater goers, would have had some exposure to the silent movies where you had normally a combination, a mix of text to read and visual elements that add the core of narrative, right. right? So if you go back to the movies of Frank Capra, for example, you find a lot of those newspaper scenes, but in general, 
it was used a lot because if the hero is famous enough to be covered, and we saw that also in Little Caesar, I believe. Probably, uh, probably yeah. Little Caesar would have had uh, those things. There is also a 20th century assumption that the press is still very influential, mm -hmm. right? Uh, at least as much as TV. Um, I'm a journalist, that sounds like the dream. <laughs> right, in many ways. And you just have to look at the numbers, yeah. right? Even if you look at the sheer number of copies sold, especially in Europe, of, of newspapers sold. There you find a lot of influence and that influence has decreased greatly. And, and I, I follow the Italian press and of course they also cover uh, routinely the number of copies sold by a variety of newspapers. Compared to the 1980s or 90s, the numbers are a sixth or a seventh, the number of copies sold. That's how dramatic uh, the, the change was. So, yeah. Whereas in the American version, they introduced from the first couple of two or three episodes, they introduced TV, mm. right? As uh, uh, the, the, the media of the medium of, of reference. Yes. What about the use of darkness, for example, in several of the scenes that we watched? on Friday. The lighting is just extraordinary. It's, I mean, it's something that a lot of, I mean, well, that some of the, like the best BBC serials um, kind of get right. I think of Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, which mm -hmm. is as, I mean, just uh, another BBC show, which is like, you know, despite that, you know, low budget and mostly being people sitting around talking is just, looks extraordinary at like half because of that lighting, particularly with Urquhart, they're just, Kind of eating up the whole theatrical Shakespearean villain aspect where they just have him sitting in the shadows where it's subtlety is not always a virtue because like sometimes it's just fun to watch someone uh, be a scumbag mm -hmm. and sound Shakespearean while they're doing it. Yes. Yeah, about the lighting too, there's a specific scene where Roger's leaving the house and he's like about to go get poisoned and there's everything's like dark but there's one light shining down right on him. Mm -hmm. so, that was like, but even more than that I would say it is the scene where Roger O'Neill is confessing to yeah. his worst scene and, and how he feels that he has degraded his human experience with Urquhart in the back, not saying anything, sitting in his chair, uh, surrounded by, by darkness, and it's kind of a satanic presence, right? Because it was Urquhart from the very beginning to blackmail Roger O'Neill into descending down the path of corruption even more or more quickly than he had ever imagined. Right? It's so that, mm -hmm. um, what, what, what else? Uh, oh, yes. So going back to one of the points that I made on Friday, besides this series feeling bit dated in terms of style and keep in mind that the uh, so in between in, in a matter of a few days last week I mentioned how the series was available uh, on Prime Video for Prime members for, for free it was removed from the freely available uh, titles and it was replaced with a paid version and the paid version is the 4k version of course the, the series was uh, never shot in 4K, and let me tell you, the 4K version is worse than uh, the regular version because TV was was not that bad in terms of photography, and uh, the, the 4K version uh, they enhanced the contrast, but they made it managed to make make it fuzzy in in other in some scenes in other scenes a bit. Uh, fuzzy and, and the colors are, are not um, the same. But one thing that I remarked was that in order to have any kind of leadership and use it profitably with a combination of force and influence, you need to have some kind of charisma. You need to have people drawn to you 
even when you are duplicitous, right? And from that point of view, my personal opinion was that Ian Richardson plays the character beautifully, but uh, Urquhart doesn't have that much charisma. We have no trouble, no problem believing that he is being duplicitous. However, and, or, or that people might fear him and feel his power in terms of influence, in terms of being seductive in political terms, let alone in human and sexual terms in reference to his relationship with Mati, I, I find that harder to believe. What did you find about the character? Uh, did you find the character to be charismatic enough, to be carrying enough influence to sustain his leadership, or just Machiavelli and just Duplistus without much charisma? Interesting, but not charismatic. A lot of it is that his is that he's not completely a uh, kind of psychological or naturalistic figure. He is kind of, well, like you said, a satanic figure. He's kind of almost pure lust for power, pure libido, which is, if it's if it's charismatic, is a different category of charisma. Um, so so it, where it's kind of you know, playing on people's uh, vices um, and they almost like on this basis of kind of understanding them on some level and breaking down the will, which um, seems to kind of mm -hmm. go right past that um, aspect of kind of charming and winning people over, where it's, where it's authority without love. Mm -hmm. But what did you think then of the fact that Mari seems, Mari Storin, the young journalist, seems to be seriously attracted to him and, and authentically enamored that she appears to fall in love with him, even though she herself is trying to be manipulative. She's recording their meetings, their encounters, including uh, when they have sexual encounters and, and they're in bed. I think it means a man wrote it. <laughs> uh, I, I, Not believable, right? Yeah, yeah, that, that's, yeah. that's about what I thought. But also just, I think it helps yeah. actually see scenes of them interacting, because I don't think we really got much of that in the episode that we watched. Mm -hmm. No, but there is this ingenuity, this, this naivete, rather, uh, to the character in some of the scenes, to the character of Manny Storin, that doesn't really come out as entirely believable. Absolutely. Okay, so keep in mind, this is what we're talking about when we're talking about chapters uh, 13 and 14 that we'll look at today. We are still within a group of three chapters where Machiavelli, in the middle of the book, The Prince, is discussing the use of soldiers, especially mercenary soldiers and auxiliary troops. Mercenary soldiers are soldiers that are hired by states during the Renaissance, states such as the city of Florence. For the most part, they come from outside the state. Keep that in mind. We're talking about entire military unit from the size of a battalion to the size of a brigade, so from a few hundred men to uh, a few hundreds uh, to uh, a few thousand that are being uh, hired for a period of time by negotiating with their leaders, with their military leaders, and they come from areas of Italy or areas of Central and Eastern Europe where the local population relies for their economy on the influx of money produced by sending out their young men and adult men to fight in different places for sometimes just a few months a year from April through October usually or for a few years in a row if there is a heightened kind of crisis. Auxiliary troops instead are the troops that 
some other government will make available for use temporarily as the result of some kind of diplomatic agreement or alliance. So both mercenary and auxiliary troops come from outside the state and therefore Machiavelli's conclusion is understandable that they would be much harder to control. So keep in mind that we're still observing the emphasis uh, on both the material use of force, going to war with these soldiers, and the immaterial or indirect use of force, for example, having a reputation based on your control of a good quality army that would ensure fewer attacks from the outside because people would think that you're easy, that you're that it is difficult to defeat you. And of course, the other side of the equation is how much authority based on this force you have within the state. So this is the borders of the state, the interactions with other states, this is inside the state. Keep in mind also the central notion of control, power means to have control of a situation, and power in general is not finite, according to Machiavelli. Keep in mind this distinction, which is one of those that is kind of lost sometimes in the scholarship or in the reactions of the average reader going through the prints. In general, power is not finite, but whenever you enter into a situation, Whenever you engage in a war, for example, in a specific context, then the amount of control within that situation is finite. So the more control you lose, or the more control you assign to others, for example, troops that are not directly loyal to you, the less control you have for yourself. And, uh, and, and therefore, you, you enter a kind of difficult situation. So chapter 13 is about the auxiliary troops, troops lent by another government. Chief example would be the French troops that the uh, French monarchs from that period could make available to the papacy or to other Italian states even the city of Florence was during several years in this period, within this period, uh, close, very close to the French monarchy. According to Machiavelli, auxiliary troops, they're even worse because you have less control over them. In fact, if they lose the war for you, you remain defeated. Remain is the key here, meaning you cannot come back from that kind of defeat. If they win the war for you, so if they deliver on the goal that you had in mind, you remain their prisoner because their amount of control is increased as a result of this victory. And within the same situation, uh, you have less control. However, as usual, you can find exceptions in this case, the reference is to Pope Julius II, who succeeded Cesare Borgia's father after a brief uh, papacy. And Julius II was very much a political leader and even a military leader. He engaged in many military campaigns in central and northern Italy with the help of French troops. The exception in this case can be explained with good fortune, which brings us back to the theory that we have uh, many times looked at that a true Machiavellian system is one where you find a certain amount of predictability of the outcome and repeatability of the outcome. That is to say, you don't rely just on circumstances that might not occur again in your favor in the future. 
It also tells you what we've said multiple times, that the Machiavellian system does not rely on complete predictability, complete reliability, or complete repeatability. That those exceptions are the result of the understanding that you can have a probable victory, but you can never be completely sure, 100% sure, of how and when you will achieve your outcomes. And of course, the last sentence is the simple corollary of what we said before. The plot for your ruin is already prepared. They, the auxiliary troop, are all united and all directed toward the obedience of others. United is a reference to the influence that is to be found within those military units, but that influence is exercised by someone else, by other military and political leaders, because those troops are not formed, comprised of citizens in your state. So uh, it's not your influence there. And obedience of others means a reference to force. There is an external authority, in that case the King of France, who can enforce, who can use force over the troops to ensure their loyalty if influence is not enough. Neither aspects of power here are controlled by the person, the leader who borrowed those troops and therefore it automatically you know that uh, all the power in the hands of these troops means less power in the hands of the leader. Machiavelli then goes through a comparison between mercenary troops and auxiliary troops, but we can skip that and go to the conclusion, right? A wise prince, therefore, and you find the kind of logical uh, development of the reasoning that is typical of the prince and especially some chapters including these and you find all the elements i just i just took the passage and broke it down line by line with different levels to show you the logic in the reasoning has always avoided such arms auxiliary or mercenary and relied on his own. Machiavelli favors arming the citizens, training the citizens, even though he himself, during his life experience, failed at creating a successful uh, military unit made of peasants. And the issue clearly, in a, an early modern society such as that of the state of Florence, was the same kind of issue that uh, Western countries and other countries throughout the world are facing. That is to say that the citizens of Florence don't want to fight for their own state. They'd rather pay someone else to do it. And the next best choice for Machiavelli in real life during the 1500s, when he was serving the so-called Republic of Florence, was to arm the peasants. Because the peasants, being uh, less powerful, less influential, as members of the state, they were uh, at the margins of society already. And being more impoverished, respond more quickly to the promise of any kind of salary or reward, and they can be trained and uh, made to serve in these military units, but those units were not very effective for Florence when Machiavelli was in charge of organizing that rural army. He has wished rather to lose with his own men than to win with others. It's just another way to say, look at the issue of control. Even if you win, you, don't, you have not gained much control over the context, over that specific context judging it not a true victory if it was acquired with the arms of others, both in terms of material control and immaterial influence 
there is no positive outcome out of that. And he, once again, Machiavelli, mentions the example of Cesare Borgia. And this time, what's interesting for us in terms of style is that you see from the series of examples that Machiavelli looks at power as a process, as a dynamic process. So even though we've talked a lot about context, and what happens in those contexts, the amount of control that is gained or lost, you still have to keep in mind that any kind of context is fluid. And therefore, you have to adapt and change constantly, something that Cesare Borgia was able to do very, successful, very successfully here within the series of events, then, towards the end of his political career, right after the death of his father, he was not able to change and adapt successfully, and therefore he lost his leadership and had to leave Italy, go back to Spain, where he will die in, during a skirmish, a minor military struggle. This duke, the duke is Cesare Borgia, entered the Romagna, with auxiliary arms, bringing in troops that were all French. The French were connected to the papacy, so they gave some of their troops to be used by the son of the Pope. Officially, Cesare Borgia was uh, labeled a nephew of the Pope. Of course, everyone knew that he was his son. And with these, he took Imola and Forlì. So the evidence is there that you can use auxiliary troops with success, but then you have to manage the consequences. But since he did not think such arms were safe, he turned to mercenary arms, since he judged there was less danger in them. Right? So even though Machiavelli has just criticized both the use of mercenary troops and auxiliary troops, he leads you through a reasoning where you can see how Cesare Borgia dealt with both. And, in reference to mercenary troops, he engaged the Orsini and the Vitelli. Orsini and Vitelli uh, were families of minor aristocrats from central Italy, the region north of Rome, between Rome and southern Tuscany. And they uh, uh, supported their local communities with the money that came from their activities as mercenaries. Cesare Borgia relied on them and then uh, took care, eliminated the, their leaders. So whose arms, when he later discovered them to be doubtful and disloyal and dangerous to manage, he eliminated. And once again, notice how Machiavelli, very matter-of-factly, is talking about the physical elimination of people. Because if it is a necessity within a context, then there is no uh, moral inhibition that should be applied to this uh, elimination. However, we will see in later chapters, 15, 16 especially, that altogether, you cannot simply say that Machiavelli advocated for the use of evil as the principal instrument of politics. It is mentioned more often because of the circumstances of the historical examples that Machiavelli takes from contemporary history, but you will see in chapters 15 and 16, and sometimes in, and a few times in the chapters after that, that Machiavelli is also considering the positive qualities connected to leadership and mentioning how you can be successful, even rely on positive qualities. It's all about the matching between the context and the qualities of leadership. So evil is not the only key to the solution of political or military issues. It is within this context, which is often the context that Machiavelli had in front of him, him, Machiavelli, and his contemporaries. 
and he relied on his own. So you can see that Machiavelli is interested in this process. He knows that auxiliary troops and mercenary troops are being used by states in Italy, including the state of Florence. And he's providing an example of how to exploit the strength of auxiliary troops and mercenary troops and then get rid of them and transition to what Machiavelli favors, which would be troops that you can control, over which you can have not only power, but also influence. And one can easily see what difference there is between the one and the other of these kinds of arms. If one considers what a difference there was in the reputation of the Duke, and as I said, reputation here is reference to what in modern terms we would call deterrence. So having a reputation in this case means that you don't have to go to war with all of your enemies because your enemies will be intimidated by the amount of power and influence that you have. And at least some of them, or at least some of the time, they will refrain or abstain from attacking you, etc., etc. So you see, uh, Machiavelli is developing the reasoning by saying the reputation increased from the time when Cesare Borgia relied on first auxiliary troops and mercenary troops, then his own soldiers. And one will find that his reputation always increased, that is the increase of control that we were talking about, and he was never esteemed so much as when everyone saw that he was completely in possession of his own arms. So it's not just about how many soldiers you have, but the amount of control you have over the soldiers. And the more control you have, because they are your own soldier, and therefore you can have also influence, they can respect you, they can love you, they can be loyal with you in a collaborative, in a cooperative fashion, the more you have those things, the more you have a complex kind of leadership based not just on numbers, it's not a game of numbers, but also about the immaterial qualities of influence and reputation. Okay, He goes through an example how France had a combination of mercenary and auxiliary troops for a while and they were successful. And then, once again, Machiavelli repeats that you cannot be dependent on fortune. You have to have enough control of the situation that it doesn't matter what happens. You're ready for everything. And he goes back to emphasize the importance of reputation. Keep in mind, within the context of chapters about the military, about soldiers, see how much emphasis there is on reputation, on deterrence, on influence, instead of saying, instead of talking about the kind of weapons, the kind of tactics that makes you successful, or how big an army should be, or the kind of fortress and fortifications you should have, right? Here you see what we've been talking about, how influence and force together are the key to understanding Machiavelli, but the most innovative part is this emphasis on influence based on the fact that use of force is more expensive, requires more resources, whereas influence can be built with skills, simply, if you have the right kind of leader, etc., etc., and I'll skip. Machiavelli provides four examples. One of them is Cesare Borgia, but he goes back even to the Bible, of course, as an example of using your own soldiers. Even in chapter 14, where Machiavelli says, what is the art of the leader? What is an art that the leader can cultivate, he's saying. That is to say, the leader needs to be born with leadership skills needs to develop those skills if there is one skill that you can enhance through training and preparation, that is warfare, okay? So he's saying that 
when it comes to being an influential leader, having charisma, you need to have those qualities and then perhaps refine them. When it comes to being a good military leader, there, there is a lot you can learn, even if you didn't possess those virtues naturally. And once again, Machiavelli will be talking in this chapter about material and immaterial side to the art of warfare and training for it. And you see that this is what the leader has to do in order to prepare for war with deeds and with his mind. But both are combined. It's, it's never just what you do. It's always the kind of knowledge you acquire. As to his deeds, beyond keeping his men ordered and trained, ordering here means organized, having a structure to the army, he must be frequently on hands. Now, keep in mind that hunting was one of the favorite pastimes of the Medici's, and keep in mind that Machiavelli is writing this book with an idea in mind that he will give this book as a gift to the Medici's and they will employ him again. I mentioned how the Medici's liked hunting so much that when you go to Florence and you happen to see a popular poster with the 12 villas of the Medici's, the reason why they have so many is simply because several of them were placed not in any kind of strategic location in terms of their political campaigns <coughs> and garnering support from citizens from different areas of Tuscany, not just Florence, but several of those villas were in places where, there was, where hunting was, was good because there was plenty of animals uh, to hunt, birds, etc., uh, or, or deers, or boars, wild boars, etc. Okay, so keep this in mind which Machiavelli knew his principal breeders would catch. So he must be frequently on hats. And through these, accustom his body to hardships. So it seems like he's talking about becoming stronger. Not entirely. It's still a combination of physical strength and mental training, therefore knowledge. And meanwhile, learn the nature of terrains. And from this point on, it's not about the physical strength anymore. It's all about knowledge. Recognize how mountains rise, how valleys open up, how plains lie, and understand the nature of rivers and marshes and take very good care, uh, great care in this. This knowledge is useful in two manners, says. First of all, you get a better knowledge of your own territory where you might have to defend your state if you're attacked. The other thing is that the terrain can be exploited tactically in similar circumstances. So when you go out and you see valleys and rivers and mountains, you know how to exploit the terrain in order to gain an advantage. Um, here, for example, the ridges, the valleys, the plains, the rivers, the marshes that are in Tuscany have a certain similarity with those of other provinces, so that from the knowledge of the terrain in one province, one can easily arrive at the knowledge of other provinces. And he mentions a leader from Greek history who goes out with his men and then engages in military, in the contemplation and analysis of military scenarios. If your enemies were on top of that hill, and we found ourselves here with our army, which of us would have the advantage? Of course, usually, if you occupy a superior position, you have the advantage. How could one get to meet them while preserving order, meaning without the troops dispersing, the troops remaining cohesive within their unit. That is one of the pillars of warfare during this time, to be able to move a unit on the battlefield 
without the soldiers dispersing because the closer they are to one another and the better uh, they can defend themselves. If we wanted to retreat, what would we have to do? If they retreated, how would we have to follow them, etc., etc. So you see that it's more of a mental exercise. It's all about the knowledge of the terrain and the mental preparation. And to further emphasize the mental aspect, Machiavelli says, so those were the, the deeds which were supposed to be material, and they were not so. Then for the mind, the other branch of this reasoning, Machiavelli says you have to read books and you have to find leaders to model your leadership on. You have to find the type of leader in previous history that best matches your situation, your context, and your skills and see how they acted and imitate them. And he also provides examples. So Roman general Scipio or Scipio used Cyrus in the biography written by Greek historian Xenophon. And uh, Julius Caesar imitated Alexander. And Alexander the Great had imitated Achilles, the hero of the Iliad, of the war between the Greeks and the city of Troy, etc., etc. I'll use my Kindle app to introduce chapter 15. So these are directly the pages from the book as you find them. Let me see if I, okay. So this would be page 85 of the book, chapter 15. On those things for which men and especially princes are praised or blamed. And here you see that Machiavelli will introduce a wide variety of qualities, both negative malicious, evil, and positive, saying that either can lead to success. Because it is not, there is nothing intrinsic in those qualities, whether they be negative or positive, that will produce success. It all depends on what the context requires. It all depends on what will make you successful. And therefore, it's not about ethics. It's about assessing the kind of skills and the kind of strategies that are necessary to achieve the outcome in a particular context. So Machiavelli is saying that traditional values and the traditional views of society need not apply to politics at the same time. Keep in mind that Machiavelli is just talking about politics. He's not denying the validity of ethics in general. He's just saying that within that particular kind of game, you have to look for something else. Outside of that game, for example, whenever Machiavelli is talking, looking down from the position of leadership, he's talking about the citizens, he wants the citizens to be as honest as possible. And if they're not honest and good by themselves, then boundaries have to be enforced by the leadership to make them, not only make them honest, but to make them habituated to honesty to make them practice honest and good behavior day after day until that becomes second nature to them. So keep this in mind. Don't fall for the trap of saying that Machiavelli simply advocated for any and all kinds of evil in any and all kinds of situations. It is not as simple. And this is a famous passage this would be the perfect illustration to what I was saying in reference to Benigna Machiavelli, the difference between ideal values and actual reality. Many have imagined republics and principalities. Of course, when Machiavelli is saying many, he's talking about other philosophers of politics. Have imagined republics and principalities that have never been seen or known to exist in truth. So books written before Machiavelli usually include all the perfect qualities that a model prince should have. 
for there is a, such a distance from how one lives to how one ought to live, and that he who abandons what is done for what ought to be done learns what will ruin him rather than <coughs> what will save him. Since a man who would wish to make a career of being good in every detail must come to ruin among so many who are not good. Which is like saying, look at the context, and if the other <coughs> competitors for the same goal are not bound by the rules, then you shouldn't be following those rules either. Because otherwise you are limiting your game and your chances for victory. Hence, it is necessary for a prince, if he wishes to maintain himself, to learn to be able to be not good. Not, he's not saying the prince must be an animal, a criminal, some kind of cruel man. He's just saying that even if you're good as a leader, even if you're a good man, you have to be able to not be good whenever necessary. And that is vastly different from the simplification of Machiavelli, uh, alleged, Machiavelli's alleged endorsement of everything that is evil. And to use this faculty and not to use it according to necessity. Okay? A lot of what we've talked about in this semester is in this passage, including the psychological limitation that it's like Machiavelli is assuming that it is possible to turn a switch and be good or be evil depending on what is necessary in the context without that affecting your psyche. Whereas we know a lot more about post-traumatic stress disorder, how people who even used violence in a justifiable and socially justified way from soldiers to cop in the long run suffer the consequences of their engagement um, in violent uh, activity, activities. And as I said before, you find here a mix of good and bad qualities. I say that all men, when they're spoken about, and especially princes, because they're placed higher, are noted for some of the following qualities which bring them blame or praise. One man is held liberal, one a miser, one is held a giver, one rapacious, one cruel, one compassionate, the one is held a breaker of faith. The other faithful, the one effeminate and pusillanimous, the other the one the other fierce and spirited, the one kind, the other proud, etc. etc. It's not about these qualities will be Machiavelli's conclusion. We cannot say that one of these qualities is good and the opposite, its opposite is bad, or vice versa. Because it all depends on the interaction between these qualities and the context. So even good qualities have a place in specific contexts, okay? So don't fall for anyone saying that Machiavelli simply said, be evil, and don't have any remorse and get what you want with any means possible. No. And as I said many times, in uh, the, the context of media-dominated political campaigns, Machiavelli would say be evil as little as possible because the more evil you do in terms of being immoral, dishonest, cheating, being duplicitous, and the more you expose yourself to the risk of being denounced and your image being tarnished through the use of media, such as the internet, Twitter, Instagram, any kind of social media that you cannot possibly control in the way that it was easy to control newspapers when you just have a few uh, relevant uh, owners of newspapers to connect to in previous centuries, the 20th and the 19th century. I'll stop here. Thank you for your patience. Make sure the attendance is returned to the table.